On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Jason Wilcox. He is the head of auto technology at Jerry. We're going to be talking about how you can help your development team, the engineering team, understand the business value they generate. And uh, Jason's got a unique experience with this as well, because he just himself has uh, been at Jerry for a few short months. And uh, he's got to uh, have uh, ramped up on some of this content and going to be curious to see how he's sharing that experience with his team. Jason, thanks for being on the on the show. Yeah, thanks, Mira. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So I guess help us understand, um, as the head of auto technology, what your responsibilities are, and, and also tell us what Jerry does. Sure. Thanks, Mira. So let's start with Jerry. You know, for your listeners that aren't familiar with Jerry, we're essentially building a car ownership assistant, right? So we know that consumers are looking to save time and save money with pretty much everything related to their car, right? All that car stuff. And so what Jerry does is it does a lot of comparison shopping for insurance, maintenance, repair, warranties, parking, financing, and puts a lot of that right at the fingertips of the consumer. So, you know, our founders came at it from the belief that drivers really deserve better, that they deserve to have an experience when they're shopping or looking for maintenance or financing that really is with the times, right? So something that is quick and easy and provides a very frictionless experience for the consumer. You know, we think that's how it should be for consumers that, you know, ultimately consumers should be happy with that sort of experience. So, you know, Jerry uses a variety of artificial intelligence, machine learning, bots, coupled with a you know pretty uh, slick application to provide a great user experience for consumers to really address all of their car ownership needs. You know, anyone who's interested can hit our website at getjerry.com and they'll be able to compare a variety of insurance quotes, download the app and really get a feel for the experience and what we're doing. As far as myself, what I do as the head of technology I'm really involved in a lot of different aspects of the organization. So I work with the CTO, I work with the engineering team, I work with a variety of the business teams to address things like new product development, regulatory and compliance needs, information security, business continuity, all sorts of things that lie across the technology landscape. I do a lot with uh, vendors and uh, different partners that we're working with so that we can provide the best experience to our consumers and really utilize a lot of different technologies so that it makes everything that a consumer wants to do in relation to their car ownership experience as frictionless as possible, right? Nice and seamless. That's our goal. You know, we have a great motto here of make the customer happy. And so from a technology standpoint, uh, regulatory compliance, all that, that's what I get to do. Awesome. Sounds like an exciting opportunity. And I know you recently joined. And maybe let's start with that, right? So from the context of the episode, we're talking about you know, helping developers understand business value to generate. You just started. So obviously, you have to start someplace to understand some of the behind the scenes of what's going on. How 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 did you handle it? You know, coming up to speed on the industry on on the you know particulars of what Jerry do, does actually. I have had the opportunity to touch a lot of different parts of the automotive stream. I've worked in fintech for years, so I've worked in auto refinance and auto debt portfolio management as a CIO of managed service company years and years ago. I worked with dealerships handling their technology. So oddly enough, from a subject matter experience, I've certainly touched a lot of parts of the auto world. What's interesting is is that, you know, if you were to go to getjerry.com, you would see a lot of context and content about insurance. That's really where Jerry started. And so coming in, I've had to really ramp up pretty quickly on the insurance side of things because I have the subject matter for a lot of different other areas that Jerry's looking to play in and roll out new services. But it's definitely been interesting. It's a startup, so things move fast. And the people that are on board, including myself, have to be able to uh, really cater to that speed and and making sure that, you know, we can keep up with the vision of the business and and how quickly, you know, the founders want to drive towards that vision. Absolutely. 
And I guess, you know, based on what you just said, you had some context and understanding of the industry at a high level. And I'm sure as you're expanding your team, you're bringing on people that will have to gain that knowledge and gain that understanding. And, you know, once you start the job and, you know, your head's down and and you're developing or whatnot, then, you know, you kind of are less focused on that. How do you help, I guess, new hires? What do you do to help them understand the vision of the company and and kind of, you know, and maybe just, you know, talking about the ramp up period. And then in the second question, you know, will be is, you know, how do you maintain that down the road? Because obviously once you're in, you're in. (laughs) Yeah, that's very true. What I'll say is at least the initial ramp up in the early onboarding, there are a variety of videos, some manifestos, things like that, that the executive team have worked on that really outline the vision and the goal of the company, which is awesome. It's great content to have, and it's great content to be available to anyone that we're onboarding, right? Whether it's in the technical team or as a consumer agent or as someone on data analytics or marketing. So, you know, having that content available is fantastic. At the end of the day, right, the whole goal is to make customers happy. So selling the vision isn't a sale at all, right? It's really something that a lot of people who are in organizations and businesses like Jerry want to drive to, right? They're looking for some significant purpose and really providing consumers or a customer with a great experience and making customers happy is one. Now, driving to, you know, continuing that mission and continuing to get buy-in from team members that you're onboarding, continuing to get I'd say that interactive feedback of, are we doing a good job? Are we driving to the mission and the vision that we're talking about? Yeah, that's something that it's a little bit more difficult. It's not as easy as having great content in that early ramp up period, but it's making sure that you stay engaged with team members and that you really have an environment that drives team members to continue to do work that impacts the business and that they have visibility into what they're doing and how it brings value to the business and ultimately how it brings value to the customer. Yeah, and I guess in the, in that context when you're I guess, you know, fast forward someone's been in the seat for, you know, 2 years and you know, they're pretty comfortable with the company and and they're pretty comfortable with what they're doing. How do you get their attention to focus on the bigger picture sometimes because obviously being heads down you're in the weeds you necessarily don't really care you've got deliverables but obviously as you mentioned the vision's changing things are moving really fast how do you get them to stay engaged that's a good question i'd say that you know if you were something like that two years in and you're trying to drive to re-engaging or you're having to make an active effort in getting someone's engagement in changes in the vision or evolutions or refinement, my personal feeling is that you're probably doing something wrong in the two years leading up to that two-year period. I think that if you are providing the right environment where, yes, people are onboarding, they're putting their heads down, they're doing a variety of strategic and tactical work, and they're providing value for the business, providing value for the consumer, that's all great. But I think a lot of people today, again, are really looking for some intrinsic values in whatever job, whatever company they're engaged with. And so over that two-year period in your hypothetical, I think really aligning the culture and the teams to something that keeps that business value on the forefront goes a long way into having to answer that conversation two years later. I think it's something that is much more active and that if you are building and leading a team to some sort of endpoint, that keeping some of that vision and keeping that alignment with your customers and with your business value along the entire way makes it so that at some two-year point, you don't have to attack that. Do you think, I guess, and this might be a loaded question, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts anyways, but um, when let's say somebody down the road does lose connection to the cause, I mean, it could be everyone could bear bear some of that, but I mean, is that more 
that particular employee sometimes? Is it potentially the manager, you know, the relationship with the company? And I mean, I guess everyone does share blame like that happens, but is it on the manager to make sure that someone stays engaged or do you view it as a, you know, hey, the employee needs to do their part as well? You know, I think it is a two-way street. Certainly a manager or leader is going to bear some responsibility. If you have a manager who is managing to the bottom line or managing to some dollar value or something like that, and it doesn't align with the people that they've onboarded onto their team, you're never going to have the right engagement that really builds that culture and that environment that people want to stay in in a long time. At the same time, on the employee side, you know, it's incumbent for the employee to have a pretty good understanding of what drives them and, you know, ultimately being comfortable having those conversations with their managers or their leaders and knowing, okay, how do I communicate the things that drive me and make sure that the team and the business are in alignment with that? You know, personally for me, when it comes to uh, teams and developing team members and leading team members, I really like to align with the employee's interests, right? And to have some sort of tangible context between what they're going to be doing, what they want to do in the future, the things that drive them, and where the business is going. And so, you know, you might find someone who can be a fantastic employee, but if their intrinsic goals are not aligned with the company's intrinsic goals and there's a disconnect there, well, then, you know, the employee and the manager probably have done a disservice to each other at the beginning. So really finding and, and making sure that there's alignment there is going to help you get to that end goal that you're looking for of really good buy-in by the employee and really good development on the organization's point for that employee. I think that's exactly spot on. And as as a manager, you know, what tools do you have? I'm assuming the one-on-one you know, you're picking up other stuff. So, so I guess in that case, you know, what are some of those tools? How valuable is the one-on-one? Are you trying to spot this, you know, during daily work? Because sometimes, you know, employees won't bring it up. They, you know, their heads down, they might be frustrated. They just won't talk about something because they might not feel comfortable. I mean, it could be a multitude of reasons. That's very true. And, you know, I'd say there's a lot of organizations out there that aren't necessarily bought into the idea of having really good transparent conversations with their employees about some of the things that aren't specifically business, right? But, you know, you mentioned the one-on-one. The one-on-one is a fantastic opportunity for a manager or leader to align with that specific employee. And if they make it about the employee's time and they make it about the employee and what they want to discuss versus, you know, a spot review or a opportunity to discuss some task that is being done, you're going to get the employees buy-in a lot more. You know, I, I've managed a variety of technical and non-technical personnel over the years. And I've really tried to instill that the one-on-one is their time. And sometimes you do have to coach people through understanding what that means, right? A lot of people are not used to having dedicated time with their leader or with their manager to just talk about the things that are on their mind or that they might be thinking about. And I've had people who they want to talk about things like camping in a one-on-one, or they want to be task-oriented or you know, all sorts of things under the sun. But the key is making sure they have the buy-in that it's their time and that as a manager or leader, you're not usurping that time because it's this 30-minute chunk or this hour chunk that you can get with someone. So I think the one-on-one is a, is a great tool. You know, a, another good tool, I think that helps coach people along and feel very comfortable around having those conversations and feeling like they're empowered to have discussions with their fellow employees and with their manager and leaders is making sure that they have context around the greater idea and the greater pieces that are involved in the business and what they're doing, right? So that kind of goes back to that focusing the team on business value. It's one of the things that I think is a little bit intangible. You can't almost touch it like a one-to-one, 
But if as a manager or leader, you're good at providing context around specifically what that employee or what that team member is doing and how it really impacts the business, again, they take kind of that next step into the buy-in, right? Where it's no longer just a job, that there are other things besides a paycheck that all of a sudden starts to become important to that team member. To piggyback off that, you know, I guess maybe the emotional side where, you know, an employee has, you know, vested, you know, they're working hard. Let's say they've been there, you know, a certain amount of years and they are in their routine. They're actually efficiently you know, executing and the business is going to start to shift potentially and, you know, might not be in the direction they want to go and they need to now reassess you know, their role. I mean, that's got to, I think some of that stuff is way more mental than it is skill wise, because obviously their skills aren't going to change. Is the one on one where you start having those conversations? Is it looping in the product team and, you know, having them talk about that shift and potentially the ramifications? Because obviously they've, you know, they're building their baby, you know, they're putting their code into this bigger uh, vision originally. How, how do you kind of deal with that? I think the one on one can certainly be used for that. There's, product discussions, their strategic discussions. If team members who are doing tactical work, right, so they don't sit at a strategic level, they're not making some of the strategic decisions, but they're carrying out the really important tactical day-to-day work that's needed. If they still get a seat at the table, right, so if they have the opportunity to understand what the business is doing strategically, and they get some of those opportunities outside of, say, a one-to-one, but things like you know, all hands stand ups, team stand ups, things like that, where they start to see some of that change and some of that strategic direction. I think team members get a lot of intangible benefits from those meetings. They may not need to be there because it may not translate into some task that's going to be carried out, but they can understand how a vision changes for an organization over time. You know, the you're right. You mentioned something regarding an employee being maybe mentally blocked or making a mental choice to not evolve or to not move forward versus, say, the skill set. And I think that's very true. You know, I've been in organizations where, especially when it comes to technology, you might have shifts in technology alignment, right? Or the technology stack, or you might have pivots on what the company is doing as a whole. And I don't know if I can think of someone that I have led or managed in the past that didn't have a good skill set that could potentially translate to, say, a change in the technology stack or a change in what the business is doing. And it always came down to there are some people that, from a mental standpoint, from a drive standpoint, you have those intangibles that change. And they decide that the organization's vision or that the organization's change in direction just doesn't fit what they want to do. And so things like one-on-ones, it's a good place to have those conversations because it's not necessarily identifying that an employee or a team member is no longer needed by the organization, but there are certain things that change. There are certain things that can make it no longer a fit. And again, I think if you're transparent, if it's an ongoing conversation versus that, hey, we're six months down the road in this change and now we're going to tell you. But if you're doing it up front, then it's a lot easier for those team members to either gradually come around to the idea that, yeah, I still enjoy what the organization is doing. I still feel like I'm aligned with the vision. And if they aren't, there's a lot of time for the team member and the organization to figure out what the right move is. So it's something that it's certainly tricky, but yeah, I think to your point, I've never met someone who doesn't have a great skill set that can't translate, but certainly different people have different things that drive them. And you want to make sure that that alignment stays there, even if the company's direction or vision is changing. I agree. I think one thing you mentioned about transparency, I think that's key. As a recruiting organization, we talked to a lot of people who are leaving roles. And it's amazing how many get frustrated uh, are leaving because they feel, you know, the vision's changed and they just aren't on board or it's just a shock to them. And, you know, maybe they're making a a rash decision because they just 
you know, are not happy with it, you know, the shift and they haven't fully digested it. So it is interesting, the mental side of these shifts to vision, they do trickle down. And, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people are able to translate their skill set. I think um, the more transparent the organization is, I think you're right. It's going to help just address any shortcomings. And I, I like a lot of what you said, because I think it really is relevant out there. You know, you mentioned re- regarding the recruitment aspect. I mean, you know, just as I can't think of someone, you've probably never had anyone come to you and say, yeah, I don't like this organization anymore because I don't understand, right, technically what they're doing, or I no longer can do the job that they're asking me. There's always something intangible that's no longer a fit. Yeah, rarely sometimes, you know, there is a technology platform shift there, you know, where they just don't like it. That does happen. But you're right. A lot of times, it's not the skill set. It's how and where they're applying the skill set that really is driving the shift. And a lot of times it is vision. They just don't believe in what's being done. Or, you know, I actually do recall speaking to somebody a couple of weeks ago said, you know, things have changed so fast and I feel like I don't even know what's going on. And uh, when you said transparency, I, I was thinking about that person. I was like, I wonder how, how much of that conversation was had up front and how much of it was a shock to the system. And sometimes, you know, shock to the systems, not sometimes, most times, they don't end well for anyone. Yeah, I totally agree. Awesome, man. I think we could chat about this subject uh, at (laughs) length and uh, you've had some great viewpoints. And if somebody does want to reach out to you to kind of further pick up on anything you've said, is LinkedIn a good place to reach out to you? LinkedIn's great. Again, they can also hit uh, getjerry.com, you know, and reach out through that if they're interested in the company or something like that. But yeah, I'm on uh, Twitter as well. So any of those ways, I'm, I'm happy to chat. Awesome. We'll include those links in the show notes. And again, thanks for being on and sharing. And uh, that's the end of this episode. We'll get this out there and hopefully get some feedback on the topic. And I always ask for two things. If you feel like you've listened to this episode and you know, I had some value, please share it. That's how the podcast has been growing. Everyone seems to be sharing it uh, organically and it's really an amazing feeling. And uh, the other thing is, if you do want me to find a guest to talk about a topic that you might be interested in hearing about, Drop me a line on LinkedIn and I'd be happy to try and find somebody to do that. And until next time, thanks. 